neat outline that I read this week uh, from John Phillips. He's one of my favorite commentators. Um, I've got all of his commentaries that I know of. Um, and he had a really neat look at the New Testament that I don't know that I've ever seen before. And maybe you have, but I, I would like to share it with you tonight. So uh, we're going to call this study Hebrews Pointed Assurance. Pointed Assurance, okay? It's a very direct and pointed assurance for uh, the people that it was written to and the people that it was written for. And we'll see the difference in just a moment. Uh, but I want to talk about this breakdown. So in the New Testament... This is neat. Um, there are, um, counting Revelation, there are 22 epistles, letters, okay, if you count Revelation as well. And here's how this goes. The first nine, starting with Romans, uh, are to Christian churches. The four, middle and the, the four sandwiched in the middle are to individuals. And then the last nine epistles are written to Jewish Christians. All right? Interesting. Um, Romans starts the first nine of the epistles, and it addresses the relationship to the Jewish moral law. Okay, Romans, uh, Romans, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians. Those are two Christian churches addressing the relationship to the Jewish moral law and the gospel. Um, the moral law would be something that even uh, Gentiles would have some understanding of, okay? And it's more about the prophets and what they said. Then you have those four to individuals. And then Hebrews starts the second nine epistles to address the relationship to the Jewish ritual law. So Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, First, Second, Third John, Jude, and Revelation, those nine. Those address the relationship to the gospel and Jewish ritual law, which is something that mostly only Jews understand because of their past and their history. Um, and that deals with more of the priests and what they did. Interesting, I never, I never saw that breakdown before or heard of that. Each grouping of, of nine, actually each grouping of nine, four, and nine, um, ends with a reminder of the second coming of Christ. Now, 2 Thessalonians deals with Christ coming on the church and the world. And Revelation deals with Christ coming on the Jew and the world. I just found that fascinating, uh, the breakdown there. So Hebrews actually begins a section of nine epistles written to Jewish Christians. Um, now, more information specifically about Hebrews. The author is unknown. All right, now, there's some strong opinions on, on who it is, and I understand that, and you can have a strong opinion on it. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't say. There's no name given. In lots of the epistles, the name is given of the writer, you know, right off the bat. But there is no name given in this one. Um, you have, some of the thoughts are it was Paul. Some say it was Apollos uh, because of its eloquence. Some say it was Barnabas because he was a Jewish believer who kind of knew uh, the, the law and, and kind of was also a, an encourager, right, in the Christian church. So here you have a guy, uh, and Barnabas, Apollos, and Paul. Those are the three uh, most uh, recognized ideas of who the author may be. Now, if you really weigh out all the evidence uh, that people give and that scholars have brought up, in my opinion... Um, the, there's three evidences that make this lean more toward Paul than anybody else. Now, obviously, we don't know. Uh, and I'll give you those three evidences that I think really turn it to Paul. Uh, first of all, at the ending of the book, when you get to the end of uh, Hebrews, it specifically mentions Timothy, who we know that Paul mentored, and they were close and spent a lot of time together, especially in Paul's last years. And it mentions an imprisonment in Italy, which we know we read in Acts chapter 28. So Paul was imprisoned in Italy, and he was a close associate of Timothy's. And it mentions both of those at the end of Hebrews. Another evidence is that Peter wrote that Paul also wrote to Jewish Christians. Um, just briefly, keep your finger there in Hebrews and go to 2 Peter 3, and we'll see that. 
2 Peter chapter 3. Peter mentions that Paul wrote to Jewish Christians as well. All right? 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 15 and 16. Check it out. 2 Peter 3.15 An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Right? Jewish Christians. Uh, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So Peter even mentions that Paul wrote to the same audience. So Paul have, has written something to Jewish believers. Could it be Hebrews? And then the third evidence uh, is uh, extra biblical, but the early church believed that Paul is the author. Uh, so the, the people in the early church believed Paul was the author. You have the uh, Timothy and uh, Italy both mentioned at the end. And then the fact that Peter mentioned that Paul wrote to his audience as well. So those are three, I believe, stronger evidences that point to Paul, but really we don't have any way of knowing exactly who wrote it. Um, the date of the writing of Hebrews, that is also unknown. Now we have a, a ballpark. We know that it had to be after the Jewish dispersion, because he's writing to Jews that have been scattered throughout the area. But it had to be before the temple was uh, t torn down because that happened in 70 A.D. and Hebrews mentions the ongoing sacrifices. And so it had to be before 70 A.D. where the temple was destroyed and after the dispersion. Most people put it around 60 A.D. But it was somewhere in that time period. Um, and so that's a little bit about the date. So the author, not really sure. The date, not really sure. The audience, this is something we're sure of. And here's why. We can surmise that this was written to Jewish Christians. Now, uh, the epistle to the Hebrews is not in the actual writing. It was, that title was given to it later based on the subject matter of this epistle. The subject matter is very uh, Jewish ritual history. Uh, the writer of Hebrews just takes for granted that its readers know Jewish history and law very well. So you wouldn't write this expecting Gentiles to know all the intricate details that are mentioned in Hebrews about Jewish law, history, tradition, and ritual. So it has to be written to a group of Hebrew or Jewish believers uh, the author assumes his audience knows the Torah well. Now, it's written to Jewish Christians. Now, here, here's where we get into the meat of this, and here's where we really need to, to start understanding why this was written, because this is, this is where it's going to hit home with us, too. Okay? It was written to Jewish Christians who had maybe some tugs on their heart still about abandoning the traditions, the laws, and the rituals for Jesus alone. Now think about it. If you were a Jew, and you know how uh, specific they are and how serious they take the, the Torah and, and their ritual and their sacrifices and their traditions, they, they take it very seriously. If you're a first century Jew and you were raised this way, and then you come to understand Christ is the Messiah and you trust Him as your Savior, all of that stuff in the past has now been fulfilled. And so to just like that, turn away from all that to Jesus alone would be very difficult. Um, much the same as a, maybe a Catholic person who would become born again um, would in a lot of ways have to turn from their upbringing and traditions when it comes to sacraments, saving them, when it comes to praying to Mary and believing that she is part of um, deity, uh, you would have to turn your back on all of that, and there would be that tug toward those rituals, you know. Um, so this was written to Jewish Christians who had still that tug on their heart that there has to be something to Judaism because God is in that, you know. The, the God of the universe, Jehovah God, he, 
that, that's who we worship. And, and he sent his son. And, and so there's this tug back and forth between Jewish Christians' heart. And so this letter is written for that pointed assurance that says, no, 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 Jesus is enough. And Jesus is better. Really the theme of, of Hebrews is Jesus is better than all those other things in your past. It's really to, to assure these folks that Jesus alone is enough. Now, that was who was written to. Now, here's who it might be written for. And this is where you and I come into play. It could be written for Christians today who try to intermingle Jewish traditions, laws, and rituals with Christ because of the substance of religion. Pious works and acts, the doing of right, the ordinances, the Bible reading, the prayers, the church attendance, the, the religion part of what we do, the things that we actually engage in, right? There's, there's substance there. There's things that we can measure, aren't there? We can measure our attendance to church, how often we're there, if we're there every time the doors are open. We can measure our time in the Word of God we can measure our time in prayer with God. We can measure how many people we share the gospel with and how many Sunday school lessons we've taught or how many hours we've spent in the nursery. These are all measurable religious things that are fine and good and have their place. But, but we can get caught up in that and that almost becomes where we find our value and where we... Uh, find our uh, righteousness, if you know what I mean. We can, we can kind of lean on our goodness and our good works and these things that we do as what makes us right with God. When in fact, there's nothing that you and I do that makes us right with God. What Jesus did makes me and you right with God. And I know that in our minds, there's this question of, well, don't I have to do things to stay right with God? Friends, if eternal security says it all. He holds us in His hand because we can't stay right with God unless He does. Peter says we are kept by the power of God. We are kept by Him. There's nothing you and I can do to make ourselves right with God. Jesus already did that. And so this could be written for me and you. We may not understand all of the, the Jewish things we're about to read in this book, but here's what we do understand. We understand religion, and we understand the grip that it can have on us. Okay, And so this is teaching us even that Jesus is enough. And Jesus is better than all of that stuff that we can do. All right. Listen, rules are easier to follow than promptings and principles. It is, and that's, that's just a fact, isn't it? It's easier to follow a rule that says, I must do this in order to gain that. That's easy, right? If there's a step, if there's a, a, um, a law or rule that says, do this and that will happen, that's easy. We can, we can grasp that, we can measure it, and we can, we can mark it down, you know. Promptings and principles are more difficult to follow. It's easier to say, um, I will not do this than it is to listen to the Holy Spirit tell us what to do. Right? And uh, so it's, it rules are easier to follow than promptings and principles. And that's why we can sometimes uh, edge back into that life. Okay? The other thing is, the structure of worship rituals. It's easier to participate in structure than it is heartfelt, vulnerable expressions of praise and worship. What I mean by that is, uh, if I come into the building, and go with me, I'm not being critical, but just, just understand this. If I come into the building and I'm dressed for church, and... They say, stand and I stand, and they sing, they say, sing and I sing, and they say, you may be seated and I sit, and they say, let's pray and I pray, and they say, okay, here comes the offering plate, and I put it in, and they say, okay, now we're going to listen to this message, and I listen, and then they say, okay, stand and leave, and I leave. There's, there's something there uh, that's easy to measure. 
it's easy to look at that and say, I am right with God because I did those things. It's more difficult to have true, vulnerable, heartfelt expressions of praise and worship that are genuinely organic, that, that's a term, that, that comes from our heart because of what Christ has done for us. Um, praise and worship flow from a heart that is understanding of the love of God through Christ. Um, that, that flows naturally. Just like when someone does something nice for you, you you're just... Thank you. You know, you don't have to always be reminded. Of, I, let's see, they gave me this, so now I'm supposed to say thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, you, you have it in your heart, right? When someone does something special for you, wow, thank you. It just flows out of your heart. And, and praise and worship is the same way when we get a real understanding. And, and look, I'm still, I still struggle with, with grabbing a hold of what Christ has done for me. And I don't know that we'll ever really get it all until we get to heaven, you know? But I, I still am trying to figure this out. God, I know you've done something incredible, incredible for me and that I don't get it all, but thank you. And praise and worship flows from a heart that, that has time to soak in it and to say, okay, wow, God, you love me this much. Um, so what are praise and worship? Those are buzzwords in church, right? Praise. Praise is celebratory rejoicing and thanksgiving. Praise is different than worship. Praise is like when your dog does well and you say, good boy. That's praise. Okay? That's, that's a, that is a rejoicing, that is a celebration, that is a thanksgiving. And so when we praise God, it is flowing from our heart, a celebration, a rejoicing for what God has done and who He is. Right? I mean, when, when I... And I, we, again, we can't get it all, but when we get a little bit of an idea of who God is, man, just praise wants to come out of your mouth. When you get a, an idea a little bit of what God has done, praise just wants to fly out of your mouth. And uh, so praise, celebratory rejoicing. Um, worship. What is worship? Worship is an attitude. It's an attitude of reverence. And humility before God in total submission to Him. Worship is really being submitted to God humbly and reverencing Him for who He is. When you read of worship in the Bible, you read of people falling on their face before God. Praise is when David danced and they played the music and, and the people of Israel blew the trumpets, right? That's praise. Worship is, is different. It's, it's a humble reverence before God. Again, why? Why would we worship? Because we, we're getting an understanding of who God is and what He's done. And we just, wow. We were in awe of Him. That's worship. And you know, sometimes in our past, whatever, conservative churches have called praise and worship a bad thing. You know, because some people have taken them to mean things that they don't necessarily mean. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, I remember as a teenager, I was kind of steered away from praise and worship. I mean, we changed the words of songs, you know, because we said, oh, don't, don't. There was a song that said something about, um, I lift my hand to you in, in, a, in a song. And I remember as a teenager, we were going through this and we were going to sing it in front of church. And we said, well, we can't say that. We need to say we lift our life to you. Like, why can't you say I lift my hand to you? What's wrong with praising God and lifting your hands up, right? I mean, when we, we go to a ball game, if somebody hits a home run, you don't go, that's great. No, we're, you know, we're, yeah, you know. There's nothing wrong with praise. And, you know, and I, I look back at that now, and I felt, you know, I was really nervous about that. Well, we have to change those words. And I look back at it now, and there's nothing wrong with lifting a hand and praise to God, you know. And it's praise, and and we've been steered away from it because we've been made to believe that that's not a proper way to praise. And it's wild because the Bible shows us that people did that in the Bible. Like, people who praised Him did those things. Um, so here, here's, what, here's what we can do. And, and, I, and I, hope, I hope we'll take this seriously tonight. 
Consider these things, and this, is, this will really put us in a spot of, of honest investigation. Remove yourself from a church service and ask yourself these questions. Do I praise Jesus outside of church? You know, at church we're told when to praise, stand and sing. Uh, we're told even what to sing, you know. If I didn't have a church service, would I praise Jesus? Do I do it on my own? That, that doesn't mean, by the way, you have to turn on music and stand up and do that. I'm mean, asking, do you praise Jesus outside of these walls? You know, because if our value and identity are truly found in Jesus, I don't have to be at 7645 Winton Road to praise Jesus. Here's the other question. Do I worship Jesus? At church, you know, a plate comes in front of me and I have an opportunity there with, in one aspect, with my income that God has blessed me with to worship Him in tithes and off. That's why I say that every time. You'll notice, I'll say, at this time we'll invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to worship the Lord with tithes and offerings. That's one way we can worship. Lord, thank you for what you've done. How you've blessed me and my family with this gift of, of income. And Lord, out of a heart of love for you, I turn back to you what you've asked for and even more. Do I, but if, if that plate is passed in front of us and, and we have a time in church to bow and worship, I want to ask this question. If I didn't have a church service, would I worship Jesus? What evidence is there in my life that I worship Jesus when I'm not here? And these are some evidences, some, some clues that we can get. Do I really praise the Lord with my life? And do I worship Him in my life? It comes down to, is Jesus worthy of all of our devotion? Am I more devoted to religious activities than I am to Jesus? How much time do I spend in this building a week versus how much time do I spend with Jesus a week? Now, I know that when you're in this building, you're spending time with Jesus. But do I spend time with him outside of this building? And Hebrews is written to those of us who may still be tied to religion as our way of feeling valuable to God. So here's a breakdown of, of the book, okay? And then we'll get into the first three verses. Hebrews begins with a short introduction. This th the first three verses introduce the book, okay? And then after that, in chapters 1 through 10, there are four contrasts, okay? Chapters 1 through 10, the writer presents four contrasts. The first one is, Jesus is better than the angels and better than the Torah, the law. The second contrast is that Jesus is better than Moses and the promised land. The third contrast is that Jesus is better than the priests, and it even brings up a name from Abraham's time, Melchizedek. You remember him? We're going to learn a little bit more about him in here. And the fourth contrast is, Jesus is better than the sacrifices and covenants. So the, the author compares and contrasts Jesus with those. And his ultimate conclusion is, Jesus is better than all of it. The author has two goals from what we can, what we can evidently get. Okay? The first one is this, to teach the readers that Jesus is superior than all of these people, places, and things. If you don't believe Jesus is superior to Moses, that's an issue. If you don't believe that Jesus is superior to the Old Covenant, that's a problem. And he brings out that Jesus alone is worthy of all our trust and devotion. And the second goal is to challenge his readers to remain faithful to Jesus despite persecutions that may come. In fact, at the end of each of those contrasts, the author gives a warning not to abandon Jesus, not to walk away from your faith in Christ. And then chapters 11 through 13, that talks a lot about faith. It's one final challenge to follow Jesus based on the role models, the great models of faith that we've had in our past. And to follow them, to follow their faith in Christ. Remain faithful to Jesus, trusting that despite trials and persecution, God will not abandon you. All right. 
So, quite a lengthy introduction. Uh, some, some why was this written? Because we want to know, is, does this even matter to me? 2019, Gentile Christian. This book says to the Hebrews. I'm not a Hebrew. Does this matter to me? I think that while it was written to the Hebrews, it is written for uh, religious folks, okay? And so let's look at it tonight. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we'll read verses 1 through 3 and get the introduction. So, he begins. God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So this is the introduction. And the book, the writer of Hebrews, like I said, different than the other epistles, usually in the other epistles, the author's name was the first word. And the first word in this one is God. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, washing away, because if Jesus is better, let's wash away everything. Washing away who might be writing, more important than that, is who is truly speaking. And it's God. God. Okay? And then the, you've got these words like sundry times and divers manners. Okay? What does this mean? Uh, sundry means various. Divers means many. Okay? So you could say it like this. God who in various times and in different ways spoke in the past to the Jewish fathers by the prophets. Or you could say it like this. God spoke to our Jewish ancestors by the prophets in various times and in different ways. So all the writer is saying is, back in the olden days, back in the day, God spoke to our fathers by prophets. Okay? That's what he's saying. Now, this is actually maybe a mini first comparison. Because he's going to compare the prophets to Jesus. So he says, back in the day, God spoke to our ancestors by prophets, but, verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now he's got a whole new way of speaking to us, and it's through his Son, capital S, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So now... God doesn't speak through prophets anymore. He has spoken through His Son. He's appointed His Son as the heir of all things. And His Son has created all things. God, through His Son, created everything. And God is giving everything to His Son. So, automatically, right off the bat, Jesus is elevated to a higher level than anyone else. He is the creator of all, and He is the heir of all. And God has spoken, chosen to speak through Him. And that's the blast that comes out right off the bat. Is this. The prophets, that's old news. Jesus is now the one you need to listen to. What He has said, take to heart. What He has said, that's what you need to do. And so he puts Jesus above the prophets right off the bat. He's spoken by his son. He's given all things to his son. And he has created all things by his son. Wow. We're already overwhelmed with Jesus, aren't we? Two verses, and we already know what this is all about. No bones about it. God is all about Jesus. And if God wants it to be all about Jesus, then brothers and sisters, it better be all about Jesus. And then in verse 3, he says, Who, Jesus, being the brightness of his glory. What is God's glory? God's glory is kind of his shine, right? His, uh, the, the, that, that, uh, that characteristic of God that is unapproachable by man. 
You know, I mean, you just can't even look at it because it's just too much. You recall the story in, when God put Moses in the cleft of the rock and he, and he covered, up, covered him up and only would pass by, you know, his backside. He wouldn't even, I mean, because it just was going to overwhelm Moses to the point he couldn't live. And so God has this glory that man can't approach to. But what he's saying, get the, get the word picture here. He's the brightness of his glory. Jesus is like, if you, you can't look at the sun directly because it hurts, but you know what you can do? You can look at the rays of the sun coming through a, a window or through the clouds, can't you? You can get what the sun is doing. You can feel what the sun is doing. You can't look directly at it, but boy, you can see it, can't you? You can see its powerful evidence. And that's the word picture we get here. Jesus is like the rays of light uh, from the sun. God's this glory that we can't approach unto, and Jesus actually approached unto us. What an, what, a, what an awesome thought that God came to man. This is who Jesus is, the author is saying. And then look at the next expression. He says, and the express image of his person. The express image. Uh, I used to, when I was a kid, we'd watch Reds ball games, And at some point in the broadcast, they would say something like, uh, you cannot uh, reproduce this video without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. I always remember that as a kid. I don't know why. Isn't that weird? Just those phrases stick in your head. You cannot reproduce the broadcast without the express written consent. Now, this is what's cool about this. When a king or an authority would write a, a letter or a scroll to someone else and send it via a messenger, the king had a, a signet ring, right? It was a little ring that had the king's crest on it, if you will. And what they would do is they would put wax on that seal. They would seal the scroll with wax, and the king would press his ring down into the wax and leave the image of his ring. The express written consent. The express image. Okay? Jesus is God's physical signature in this world saying, here I am. Take it on my authority. This is my son. Everything he says has my full authority. And didn't Jesus say in John, I only say those things my father tells me to say. Wow. So Jesus is like the rays of light from the sun. He's like the, the signet ring on the scroll of what God is doing in this world. Pretty important. Jesus is being elevated more and more, even in the first three verses. Continue in verse 3. And upholding, this, is, this blows your mind, Jesus upholds all things by the word of His power. Jesus sustains everything in this world by His word. The earth continues to spin. The earth continues to orbit. All the planets are orbiting. All the stars are moving. I mean, all the, all the universes, all the galaxies are are doing exactly what Jesus says to do. And like we said this morning, down, get this, to the very breath that you and I breathe. He upholds it all by the word of His power. That is hard to grasp. That He can keep, I mean, you talk about keeping plates spinning, right? We can't fathom that. I can't walk and chew gum at the same time, right? I mean, some of us struggle with multitasking one or two things. I can't write and listen to music at the same time. It drives me. But God, specifically Jesus Christ, upholds everything with the word of his power. You see how God is elevating Jesus here? Like, he's, he's untouchable. He's, he's above everything that you've ever read. I know that, look, it's almost like God is saying, I know that Genesis tells you all about creation, but let me tell you about the one that spoke it into existence. He's greater than what the Word says about it, right? He is the Word. So, we continue in three. 
uh, when he had, this, is, this over just throws you backwards too, when he had by himself, wow, purged our sins. It didn't take thousands and thousands of lambs. It, it, didn't, take, it didn't take thousands and thousands of righteous people to buy our pardon. Jesus Christ, by himself, bought our salvation. Whoa! Moses didn't do that. He couldn't. He's a sinner. The law cannot save you. You figured that out real fast. The rituals, the sacrifices, the temple. What did that do? The temple burnt down. The sacrifices aren't even going on anymore. What's left? Jesus. Wow. By Himself He did it all. Why would you need to look any further? Why would I look back at, at, at those rituals and say, yeah, but I gotta. Why? Jesus by Himself purged our sins. Unreal. And then it finishes with this, and this is so cool to me. I love this expression. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. There's one that gets that chair, folks. There's one who gets that throne. There's one who gets that prestigious position. And it's the Lord Jesus. It has been reserved for him. It is his and his alone. He alone is worthy to sit there. He's the only one who has the power and the record and the substance to take that seat. And I love, and I won't even demonstrate it because it wouldn't do it justice, but try to get in your mind the picture of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, walking into heaven after He ascended and paid for all the sins of the world. And He sat down. Wow. He was finished. All the stuff at the first part of this book that says you need to do, 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 and you have to make sure you get it right, and you have to He fulfilled it all. It's not about that. It's about Jesus. And in three verses, the Holy Spirit of God, through whoever, whoever this author was, says, Jesus is superior to all the ways that God revealed himself in the past, combined. So, if you try to get past Jesus in Hebrews, you've missed the entire point. Jesus is the point of Hebrews. For Jewish Christians, Jesus is all they need. For Christians, Gentiles holding to Jewish traditions, laws, and rituals, listen, Jesus is all we need. In fact, there's a part of a verse here in the book of Hebrews that we'll reference, and we'll reference this in closing tonight. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's what Hebrews is all about. Let's pray tonight. Our Father, I ask that as we study this, this epistle of comparing, contrasting Jesus to all of these things in, in the Jews' past, that, Lord, you would bring home to our hearts. We don't understand all of that, but, Lord, what you can bring home to our hearts is that Jesus is better than anything I have done or can do. And that no matter what I try to do, Jesus has already done for me. And now, Lord, that as I understand more and more, Lord, help us to understand more and more your love. Help us to understand more and more what you have done through Jesus. And Lord, I know when we understand it more, we'll praise more. We'll worship more. And then, I won't have to think about making myself do things for you. It'll just overflow when I really get a glimpse of who Jesus is. 
So God, help me and my brothers and sisters as we study this book to know you more and to know Jesus more because we want to love you. We want to praise you. We want to genuinely worship you, Lord. And I pray that you would give us what we need. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are.